Hey, welcome folks. Uh, we're just giving everyone a bit more time to file in, but we're excited to dive into today's discussion on the ARPA fund. So everything about ARPA, uh, preparing for the great project flood is the topic of today's uh, panelist discussion. So just as folks filter in, it's 101 now, I think 102, that's probably reasonable. Uh, we'll get rolling in about uh, 60 seconds or so uh, by my approximate count. Okay, whether or not that hit the full 60 second quota, that's that's okay, uh, but we are at 102 and I'm a man of my word, if nothing else. So we'll uh, we'll go ahead and hop into this. So again, for those of you who have joined in the last bit, um, welcome to this Bonfire Peer panel. We'll, we'll be discussing everything about accessing ARPA funds uh, and how procurement teams are thinking about this in terms of uh, you know what they can be doing to accessing those funds and, and how we can be preparing for the great project flood. So, uh, I will be doing hopefully as little talking as possible. Really, uh, my name is Anthony, and I'm here just to uh, make sure that we can facilitate the discussion and, and move through, uh, you know, what everyone else here has to say. Uh, but let me go ahead and take some time to introduce uh, our two esteemed guests here. Uh, so first up uh, on the on the picture here, as you can see, is Joel. Uh, so Joel is the director of procurement uh, at Louisville Metro Government in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, Joel and his team are responsible for the management of over 1,100 contracts that exist in the programmatic and operational functions of the city. Uh, Joel's team uh, approaches their procurement with an innovative mindset and the refusal of the, we've always done it this way type of mantra. Um, to Joel's credit, he also taught me how to say Louisville uh, going a few years back, and hopefully I'm doing uh, justice to that today. Uh, but thanks, Joel, for joining. Do, do you have any words you want to say to the to the folks? No, just happy to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. Awesome. Uh, and second up, we have Ken. Uh, so Ken Hillebrand is the Deputy Director of the Louisville Accelerator Team. Uh, so for context, the Louisville Accelerator Team was established in May 2021 to help guide and manage the $388 million of American Rescue Plan allocation from the federal government to Louisville. Uh, so Ken previously served nine years with the legislative body for Louisville and the last 27 years with the technology department, including 11 years as Deputy Director. Uh, so Ken has a master's degree in political science from the University of Louisville. So um, you know, real, real hometown hero here, Ken. So Ken, do you have anything Go you cards. want to say to the folks? Go cards. <laughs> Go lady cards. <laughs> there we go. That's it. Yeah. Uh, Joel and I were both in the political science program at U of L. So. Yep. yep. Oh. Well, I, I I remiss that I didn't get that on my notes, but I'll be sure to have a word with my <laughs> people. <okay>. Afterwards. <laughs> I'm just joking around. So. Uh, just to give some context to why we do these things and, and why we do these type of gatherings. Um, the purpose is simple, right? There's a lot of knowledge that um, exists out across the way different municipalities and different governmental organizations are uh, managing things. And our goal, if nothing else, is to help elevate and, and share the knowledge of, uh, in this case, with, with the folks at Louisville Metro are doing, uh, to help other teams access ARPA funds, to think about how they could more strategically be using that money or even just kind of tactically how they could be using the money in terms of reporting requirements and, and things of that nature. Um, our goal is to connect the greater procurement community to some of the experts that, that we have the, the pleasure to work with. Um, and and that's, that's really what brings us together here today. Um, I know I've been doing a lot of talking already and, and I promise we'll be getting to less of that as, as the presentation moves on. Um, but the one last thing I do wanna say here is just to encourage people to ask questions in chat. Um, we have this time so folks can come in and, and kind of lean on the expertise of Joel and Ken. So, so ask those questions in chat and, and I'll be sure to surface them as we actually move through the presentation. Just to give a, a bit of the structure of what we'll be doing in the presentation, we do have just um, some questions that, that we've sort of sourced from the crowd to get a sense of, uh, you know, one, understanding the funding, you know, where's the funding come from, things like that. Uh, and then the second portion that we'll be diving into is preparing uh, for the funding and asking questions around that angle. Of course, if you're at home or in the office thinking, oh yeah, I, there's other questions I wanna ask beyond those topics, again, put them in chat uh, and we'll be sure that you can uh, get all the questions that you have answered. 
But without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into the first section here, uh, which is understanding the funding. And maybe what I'll do just to kick things off is, is Ken, I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot, um, given the purpose of the Accelerator team and, and everything uh, you know that, that you've done for at Louisville Metro. Uh, can you give us just a background on ARPA? Like, when did the funding start and, and how, how long has that funding uh, been available? Yeah, sure can, uh, Anthony. So the funding was approved by the federal government in March of 2021, and it was called the American Rescue Plan Act, ARPA, ARPA Act, ARPA 2021. It was approved in March, and we knew we would start getting those funds, uh, you know, as something, uh, you know, several trillion dollars across the United States um, for state, tribal, and local governments, uh, and, and of course, county governments uh, included in the local there. Um, Louisville itself received $388 million. And we started, about that time, we started looking at um, how would we, you know, how we wanted to use those dollars. The federal government had some guidelines, uh, and that's when the mayor put together what he called the Louisville Accelerator Team uh, in May. The, there's an executive director, um, that he hired uh, for that for that role, Margaret Handmaker, and then myself, and then we just started putting our team together to uh, to work on this, you know. And the team really consists of our my team, which is the project managers, and we work closely with Office of Management and Budget, which includes procurement uh, with Joel. There's a grants division. Uh, there's some gr federal grant specialists on that team. Uh, so we're kind of working with all of them to uh, figure out how to how to do this and make sure we do it correctly. Yeah, I, I hear you. And I'm curious too, um, just thinking about how the, and maybe we'll touch on this a little bit later too, but just thinking about how Louisville Metro has resource for this. And, you know, uh, obviously the, the accelerator program was taken on, but um, did, you, did you find yourself adding in heads to support this initiative or were you more so just using existing resources and and we purchase, we, we definitely had to add headcount uh, to yeah. manage these funds. Our grants, um, our grants person has said this is the most complex uh, compliance and reporting grant that she's ever seen from the federal government. So we knew that we would have to. We knew we would needed to add headcount. They already added some project manager headcount in one of the organizations I'm with, the Office of Performance Improvement. So we were able to leverage that headcount that was had just been added into the budget, um, and then we've hired additional contractors. Uh, they've hired additional staff within uh, the grants management team, uh, four or five, six, maybe more people, uh, and they they identify that they may need even some more folks. We're mm -hmm. looking at adding uh, a contractor to help with compliance and reporting, uh, auditing. And then um, I'll let Joel answer this, but he probably wishes he had hired an extra person because of the volume of work we're sending his way through Bonfire. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, Thanks, the, 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 uh, from, from our perspective, we're, we're here as a support agency to what, what the administration is trying to do. And uh, to the extent that we can lean on our existing resources, that's what we're going to try to do until such time as we just can't and we start outsourcing that support right yeah that, that makes a lot of sense um just just to ask a few more more um administrative questions on, on the arpa funding because i know there's been series of funds that have been released by you know the united states federal government um some of those have had expirations like you know you need to spend these funds by x period in time is there anything like that for the arpa funds mm -hmm. yeah we have to have all the funds uh what the u.s treasury is calling obligated by December 31st, 2024, and all the funds and the programming has to be completed by December 31st, 2026. Uh, and then all of the reporting for that has to be completed by March, 2027. Uh, so we have, you know, we have a, it's a nice window, uh, but if we're looking at doing large projects, for instance, uh, affordable housing, uh, building those, that takes several years to build build those kind of projects. So we're, we recognize that and are trying to get those projects started off earlier. Uh, other projects, we may look at them and say, if we're trying to um, look at the impact of COVID on violence in our community, 
you know, we we're designing like a three year or four year program, knowing that we'll have those programs completed before 2026. And then Metro government can decide if they're seeing success in those programs, then they can identify other funding sources to continue, continue those. Yeah, I understand. And I guess just inferring from that, it sounds like the ARPA funding, it's going to be like a one time wave of funding that comes through and is, is not going to be like a reoccurring funding source, or at least it's, it's just designed right now, right? Yeah, it's designed that way. It's a one-time thing. We know this is a one-time shot, $388 million. It seems like a lot, uh, but believe me, we have much more than that that people are asking for or that even our own metro agencies have identified that they could use to help address the impact of COVID on the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then this is a, a heavier question, so I'm going to circle back to it later, but just curious about how, how a team would prioritize something like that. I, I feel like that's a very you know, daunting project to take on because everyone has all these different needs. We have this, you know, this this cash that's coming in, but as you mentioned, you you can't address everything, right? Um, right. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna save that one for the end. You know, we gotta okay. keep the people. We'll keep the people listening. You know. Um, okay. <laughs> I, I'm I'm curious, uh, Ken, if you can shed some light on this, right? It's you know, the you know the federal government has allocated certain amounts of funds to certain municipalities. Is, 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 am I right in understanding that? Like every there's certain funds allocated to each jurisdiction, or, or how are the funds actually distributed? They were distributed to to uh, states, uh, one uh, tribal governments, uh, two and then to local governments. So cities and counties uh, would be the third allocation. Uh, so we're a city, we're a combined city county government. Um, so we received actually two allocations, one for our city entity and one for the county entity at, that totaled $388 million. Uh, so, but we're also eligible for funding from the state. So the state looks at their funding and says, okay, let's allocate this across the Commonwealth of Kentucky, you know, whether they're going to do it by a formula or by, you know, 120 counties that are in the Commonwealth, you know, how they're going to allocate that. So there are some funds that we're getting from the state, for instance, for a uh, court eviction diversion, uh, we're getting some other housing funds from the state, uh, but the state will be managing those funds, uh, our team or Louisville, uh, we won't be managing those, at least from the Louisville Accelerator team standpoint. Yeah, okay, understood. And I think one of the main questions that even, you know, when when uh, folks here at Bonfire are talking to different agencies and, um, you know, I think everyone understands the funds exist and there's some number of funds that their agencies can can potentially leverage. But I think the big question is, is um, especially for smaller municipalities, right? It's like, how can we actually access these funds? Um, and, and for an organization who's, would ask that question. I mean, what, what would your take on that be? Well, I think if if it's depending on the size of the locality. So I think the U.S. Treasury divides it into entities, 250,000 people and over, and then a below 250,000 population. Um, so I'm familiar with how they allocated it to the two. Uh, cities over 250,000, and they also provide different uh, reporting and compliance requirements uh, based on those population sizes. Um, so we re we received notica notification from the U.S. Treasury, so that's how we received our notification. I'm I'm not sure how they're how they're um, notifying smaller entities or smaller organizations, uh, but I would suspect that there's some mechanism that the U.S. Treasury has for that. Yeah. Okay. No, that that makes a lot of sense. Um, and I know I said I'd defer this question a bit later because I I just wanted to make sure that everyone understands what the funding is, how teams could access it, and, and what that communication looks like. But um, diving into the meat of it in terms of how Louisville Metro has is leveraging these funds and um, you know what type of projects you're taking on, uh, what has mm -hmm. been the strategy for approaching and prioritizing spending the funds? Like, what what does that process of allocation actually look like? Yeah, sure thing. So the first, you know, when we first uh, organized ourselves in in May, we started looking at, okay, let's look, uh, you know, the federal government just had eligible uses. What are what are those things that you can do? There were, they all have to have some nexus to COVID-19 um, so that we could look at our, our response to COVID-19. We could look at behavioral responses to uh, COVID-19 substance use. Uh, responses to COVID. Um, we could look at economic hardship. You know, how are we going to address that in, in our community? Uh, we could also look at premium pay for government workers performing essential work. Uh, we could look at those government services 
uh, that are required to respond to COVID-19. Um, there was also an opportunity to look at water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure. That they and it doesn't that doesn't necessarily have to have a nexus to COVID-19. We chose not to really address those immediately. We're starting to look at something with broadband, uh, primarily because during the pandemic, uh, broadband was an issue. Uh, so folks who had uh, broadband access could work from home. Per persons who didn't or um, you know, had a job where they could work from home, but if they didn't have the broadband, they weren't allowed to. So we're going to look at some of those, some of those efforts, um, and also later on, our community, uh, our Metro Council and the Mayor agreed to look at like seven priorities uh, that they wanted to address. So housing and homelessness, uh, workforce development, um, uh, healthy Louisville, healthy neighborhoods. So that kind of covered a lot of health issues, substance abuse, uh, promoting healthy, healthy living environments. Uh, public safety, premium pay, public health contingencies. So we know, you know, we funded, uh, you know, a lot of the money from, from like the CARES grants, uh, previous uh, funds from the federal government were going toward public health, the vaccination, uh, testing, um, community outreach, uh, contact tracing, those sort of things. So, but that work continues. And so the CARES funding ended in June, so we still needed a way to provide that. So that was included. And then the, the council also included something that they called eligible infrastructure. If something was eligible, they'd like us to consider using that. Of course, the bipartisan infrastructure law that passed uh, Congress in December, that covers a lot of the infrastructure, especially transportation needs. Uh, so that hasn't been something that we're really looking at uh, to use for ARP funding. Yeah, okay. That first okay. round, I will, We'll talk about that. The first round of funding uh, that the Metro Council approved that was uh, promoted by the mayor's office or proposed by the mayor's office, it was about uh, $30 million that ended up being approved. And it was really for those things that we said, what's the emergency, the emergency response that we need to make to really address what's going on with COVID? And so those were things like court eviction diversion, uh, security deposit and rental assistance for folks who were, maybe didn't have jobs and they needed to keep their uh, Rental, so it was rental assistance. We provided funding to a local food bank uh, because they were distributing so much food, they needed extra extra staff support. So we provided uh, funding for temporary staff support for them. Uh, we provided um, suicide prevention programs, you know, looked at enhancing our current suicide prevention programs uh, because of the evidence that talked about the increase in suicide uh, during during the pandemic, and you know, I haven't seen the latest numbers, but I suspect it's still impacting uh, communities uh, around the United States and perhaps the world. Also, looking at child care emergency and safety supplies. You know, we all, I think, in many of our communities, um, child care uh, child care uh, organizations were really impacted because um, parents weren't able to send kids to child care or because they had to stay home because of school, you know, schools weren't in session, so they had to do homeschooling. Uh, and then the childcare facilities were hit uh, because of the supplies that they needed that they weren't really prepared to, to provide. So we had a grant that we provided to an organization to distribute um, uh, emergency supplies, PPE to childcare agencies. So those were kind of like a lot of the types of things that we looked at in that first round. Um, and then the second round, we kind of looked at some of those priorities that I was talking about earlier that the council had discussed. So housing and homelessness, um, public safety, premium pay, and some public health contingencies. So they're continuing to look at some other funding. So the funding for healthy Louisville, healthy neighborhoods, a little bit more on public safety. Uh, again, public health contingencies because things aren't, it's not going away. And then uh, I don't know if I said it again, workforce development. So we still have another round of funding that's coming up. We've sort of allocated, we have about a hundred and uh, about $140 million left to allocate. Um, and when you think, oh, that's a lot of money, uh, we probably have, you know, several programs that are saying, okay, well, we need 80 for this. We need a hundred for this. We need 50 for this. It's like, okay, we have to prioritize. And that's where we're using the priorities that the Metro Council and the mayor came up with back in uh, late July and early August to kind of help guide, guide our methods. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, 
I mean, that's that's extremely helpful for me to understand, and hopefully for our audience as well. There's just so many different potential applications, and I think, you know, from my perspective, what I think is unique is, as you mentioned, right? It's like one of the core requirements is there needs to be some sort of a, a nexus or a connection to COVID, like you mentioned, right? Uh, in order for us to launch these initiatives, but um, directly related to COVID or not, these are all just net good initiatives for a municipality to launch. And so, so maybe Joel, I'll, I'll throw this question your way, but uh, in your perspective, whether it's just based on Louisville specifically or in, in a broader picture or taking a step back, like how do you think these funding sources can impact municipalities? Like what do you think it's allowing teams to do? Wow, that's a, that's a big question. Um, I think it's really being able to to get at the core of it, the government is providing a public service and making sure that those dollars are being put to good use for the benefit of of, of, of our, our citizens and residents. So, um, you know, people people's attitudes towards government and um, it, it, we take it on the chin quite a bit for, for uh, people's perspectives about uh, government is this big evil, but 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 uh, everywhere you turn, there are services that that we provide on a day to day basis that people take for granted. And what this is doing is really elevating those services even uh, more than we do now in the city of Louisville to to really uh, connect with our residents and say, you know, we're here for you, we care about you, and this is a um, uh, it's enabling our departments to to really connect more with, with the people that they serve. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Uh, thanks, Joel. Um, Ken, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add to that as well, but I'll give yeah, you- Yeah, I would add something. You know, one of the things that as we were looking at the projects, um, we looked at what can we do that's gonna make an impact? You know, in that first round of funding, you know, there were several projects that's like, okay, we know it's gonna last, 30, 60, 90 days, 100, whatever, however, however many days, it's gonna get something, it's a short term. But we wanted to look at in the next round of funding for uh, our internal funding, we're not getting additional dollars from the federal government, there's just one allocation. Uh, but we're looking at our funding in a couple rounds of approval rounds really. And that next round, what is it that we can do that's gonna make an impact in our community over, over a period of time that we look back five, 10, 15 years from now and say, hey, we made a good investment in those dollars in our community and we still see that impact. Or maybe that investment was such that we had such good results um, uh, and outcomes from that project that that the government decided to continue funding it because it was so had such a positive uh, impact. Um, and we know there will be some things that that we'll fund that it's like, you know, that just didn't work out the way we thought it would. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think our, our government would look at it and say, yeah, that's probably not something we want to continue or we haven't, um, we haven't really made the, uh, made the case that it's worth continuing. I'll just add that, that it also enables us to, to, to Ken's point, try new things. You know, if, if even if we, we try it and we failed, we're, we're going beyond what what we had been able to do without these resources. So let's try some new things, see if it sticks. If it does, great. You know, if it doesn't, then we learn from that, and we, you know, we say, well, we we pivot, we don't do that again. Yeah, no, I, I think that's great, right? And I mean, I think what's really cool about all of this is just the you know, Louisville as an organization is just understanding. That, you know, there's opportunities to do a lot of good here, and and also opportunities to to try a few other things, right? Be because of what the funding has allowed allowed you, you know, both your guys' teams to do. So, um, that that's really good to hear. I think I think for the organizations at home, if I were to put myself in their shoes a bit, um, there's there's a lot of good wisdom, and you guys have spoken about a lot of really, uh, you know, really exciting and and really cool initiatives that you'd be able to pick up off the ground. Um, if you could like distill it down to steps, do you have like a few boxes that you're looking to check to identify what the opportunities are to actually leverage the funding. Maybe the first one being, how does this work back to COVID? But you know, walk me through what that process looks like after that. After that, or, or correct me if I'm my first step is uh, off. Yeah, no, that's true. You know, so like for instance, when the council established one of the working groups or one of the priority areas of housing and uh, homelessness and affordable housing. That group started meeting, they they developed, they created what they called a working group. And that working group started meeting and saying, okay, what are our priorities in our community uh, around homelessness and affordable housing? 
what are those buckets of how can we create uh, buckets of money to address something so and and they looked at that and so you know one of the things that the council did as well as the mayor's office they did community surveys um, to look at how would you, how does the community want us to spend this money uh, the council also had three public meetings out out in different geographic areas of the city to hear from residents how do you want us to spend the money so and housing and homelessness or affor homelessness and affordable housing were one of the top areas um, so when they came back they said okay we know that uh, affordable housing is something we need to look at we have 31,000 units that are needed in our community to provide homes or a sp or some space for people to live in so there's no way we're going to be able to address that need of 31,000 units or living spaces with 388 million dollars uh, I think the estimate was it was like 1.2 billion. I can't. I don't. I don't know what the number was. But so that that's how they they decided. Say, so let's put 40 million dollars towards affordable housing. We have an organization in our community called the Affordable Housing Trust Fund that the city allocates money to for that, and they're going to manage those particular projects. Another need was permanent supportive housing. So if we look at the home, homelessness in the community that are the uh, maybe the people who are homeless or perhaps living on the street or living on couches in someone else's house, how can we build permanent supportive housing for those persons? Uh, so they allocated $32 million to permanent supportive housing. We're just going through the process and we use Bonfire to reach out to the community and say, give us proposals on permanent supportive housing. You know, we laid out what the guidelines were and folks gave us um, things back for that. The other one that's really kind of interesting is uh, creating what we call a safe outdoor space, um, similar to what Denver and Austin has done. Where, and I don't know, I don't know if what the right term is. It's almost like a sanctioned tent city for mm -hmm. uh, people that are houseless. So we're setting, uh, a, we awarded this to an op someone to to operate the, the 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 safe outdoor space, what we're calling it, where. Uh, people are can come in and there's a tent that's there for them it's a uh, it's actually it's an Eskimo or not Eskimo it's an ice fishing tent so we know it's going to be warm in the in the winter and there's we're going to run electricity pallets to them so we're getting ready to kick that off in about two weeks that'll actually open uh, so much prep work for that but those that was something that the community identified or the working group from the council identified as something that was important uh, and then they also identified some other other funding, down payment assistance to help people stay in their houses or to help uh, purchase a home uh, if they haven't been able to, and then also home repair so people can stay in their homes uh, without them getting too dilapidated. So, you know, that commit that particular working group came up with like $89 million worth of, of projects uh, that they felt were important for the community to help our community uh, rebound from the impact of COVID-19 and other economic uh, problems uh, due to COVID. Okay, no, very interesting. Um, I think just um, honestly, really good ideas for, for the group to consider, I think, and just, again, think about how you can impact your community by, by accessing some of these funds. I think to, to bring it back down a bit, uh, just think about like, how, what is the structure again for, for using some of these funds? Um, this is a much less inspiring question, but I think an equally important one when it comes to thinking about how we can operationalize some of this stuff, right? Um, I, I know at Louisville that you guys have the accelerator team that's established, but for, for most organizations, like typically who would be in charge to actually facilitate this? Like who, who would be the one who kind of own and coordinate these initiatives? Um, yeah, we, so we have a, a awarding agencies. So every every grant that we give has to go through a metro agency whether that's our uh, resilience and community services which handles uh, homelessness and housing issues develop louisville which handles of uh, home repair um, down payment assistance um, we have the um, develop louisville's really is handling a lot of that we have our uh, economic development, so any of the economic development type grants that we would give, they would all go through metro agencies who already have experience in handling grants. So they already have a grant support structure, a grant, grant management structure, a program management structure. 
Uh, so our team was developed to help really support them in that, but also to help with the complexity of the uh, compliance and the reporting uh, that goes along with uh, these dollars. Yeah, okay. And I know we'll be diving into some of those uh, reporting details uh, in just a bit. Um, just one more sort of more administrative question I was curious about diving into. And, and Joel, maybe you can shed some light on this. Like when you're leveraging these type of funds, um, is, is there any like change or any like special considerations that you're taking when it comes to interacting with your supplier community? Like you might be supplying these services? Oh my goodness, yes. Because, um, you know, from, from uh, our, our typical vendor community is, is used to working uh, with us, either construction, professional services or the like, and they're in business of doing that. And so um, what, what they're not usually uh, um, experienced with is dealing with uh, funding that is federal funds, which is tied to uh, the certain procurement requirements and um, federal requirements, uh, almost acting as a federal contractor by us being a pass-through. And so it is, it's a big learning curve for many of our vendor community to engage with the city and say, yeah, we have this relationship, but now we have these other layers of, of requirements that you have to ad adhere to that you didn't have to before. And that really um, has been a, a big learning curve for all of us uh, on the vendor side and, and uh, even on our, our staff side is, you know, making sure that we're checking all the boxes to make sure that you know, that we aren't doing something that would jeopardize uh, us having to return the money back to the federal government. Because when they come in and they audit uh, audit our records, they're gonna say, did you follow 2 CFR 200? Uh, 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 and if if not, that could, that could mean that we have to uh, re return those funds. So uh, it's, a big, it's a big learning curve in uh, communicating with our vendor community. Um, Further, I would say on the on the other side, we're not used to dealing with uh, nonprofits uh, who are applying for for, for grants, and so um, you know the, they also have, depending on the amount, they they may have to follow certain or have have procurement processes in place that they may have not had to have before, and so there's a big learning curve from them. Uh, understanding what those requirements may be, uh, but I think our our team is now starting to put put uh, uh, those guidelines in place and and work with them, and they're starting to have a cadence of okay, I understand this now, I understand, and so our um, between all Louisville Metro government's team who is working on ARP, we're all uh, working rowing in the same direction and trying to get our vendor community more. Uh, up to speed on what are required in dealing with federal federal dollars. Yeah, thanks, Joel. And, and I do have a follow-up question. I'm just going to change the slide. The conversation has naturally brought us into uh, part two, preparing for the funding, but I do have a follow-up conversation on that. So um, you're, you're speaking to the lift that's required in terms of educating suppliers and letting them know about some of these new requirements. Can you share some tips or tricks about what's worked well for you to um, you know, educate the, the suppliers on that and just make sure that you, you do have those boxes checked? Oof. Well, I, I, I'm always looking at it from a weakness orientation. So I'm always thinking about what, you know, what do we still have yet to do? And I think we still have a lot of room for improvement on, on uh, bringing folks up to speed. But, but Ken's team has really done a really good job in, in kind of helping uh, uh, put together videos uh, easy to understand, interpreting all the governmental the language in terms that, that regular folks can understand and how do you apply for these phone, uh, funds and what is expected of you? And then the, 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 the grants management team is working with them to say, okay, departments and, and sub-awardees, here's what you need to do in order to, to, to comply. So um, we still have a lot of room for improvement, public facing in terms of getting people uh, uh, up to speed in our vendor community, up to speed on where we need to be. Right now, it's it feels like we're just taking it as an ad hoc basis uh, with our regular contractors. Like, oh well, let's sit down with this one. But we really need to do a broader, uh, broader effort. And we're working on putting that together. 
yeah, one of the absolutely. things, if I don't, if I can add, one of the things that we also do is for each um, each opportunity we put with that we put out through Bonfire, we call it a request for application. Um, we also have an information session, which I think is common in the procurement community, where you have a uh, an information session, but we kind of go through what it's like to apply, what we're looking for. One of the things that we're going to do for the next RFA that we're looking at, the the awarding agency has said some of these groups aren't even grassroots. They're seedlings. They're just now starting. And so we think we're going to do a more, more in-depth engagement with them. Instead of a, an hour-long information session, we think we're going to have a three-hour or two-hour walkthrough with all the interested organizations that says, here is this here is the form, the, you know, the application form that you're going to fill out on Bonfire. Here's what we're looking for on this form. Here is what a budget, here's what the budget template looks like. Here's how you fill that out. Because we think some of these organizations are going to be so new and just not have this experience um, that they're going to need that kind of assistance. So we really want to go that extra step, help them with that. And that's one of the charges to my team is, we want to reduce any any of those complexities for those those nonprofits that are that want to apply for this. We want our goal is that they're all successful. So if they get the award, uh, we want them to be successful. But we also want them to be successful in applying for the award. If someone submits a an application through Bonfire to us uh, for a request for application and they're missing documents, I have to look at it and say, I wonder how we could have communicated you know, better to them so that they know that everyone has to turn in a budget template. Everyone has to turn in a risk questionnaire um, and why some of them maybe thought that they didn't have to. So I look at that as a challenge for us to how can we better communicate that rather than thinking, well, well, well they didn't turn in the risk questionnaire, so we're going to eliminate them from the process, you know, trying to look at it, how we can improve upon our process uh, to keep everyone um, compliant. Yeah, and and I and I heard you mention this this RFA or this request for application process uh, a few times and, and mentioned it earlier as well, Ken. Um, just taking a step back, can can you holistically walk just the group here? What what is that RFA process, and and you know what are the actions that happen with it, and what are the outcomes that you're driving towards by by running those RFAs? Yeah, I think you know everyone. I think many people on the call are probably familiar with an RFP process. It's it's very similar to that, except that with an application like this, where the uh, where it's grant dollars, we're not bound to model procurement law or state uh, procurement law. So we we selected uh, Bonfire. You know, we went to Joel and we said, "Hey, Joel, we need to have a tool that like I knew how the RFP process worked from when I worked in technology. So it's like I'd like to see how we could use that." for the RFAs, because I like the structure that's within Bonfire. You know, you people know how to, uh, you guys have videos that people can watch on how to apply, how to register. So, you know, we spent time teaching people how to do that. And Joel said, yeah, we can do that for, app, you know, for these sort of requests for applications. It's the, you know, the sort of the same way. And so he has someone working with us on that. When we develop an RFA, it's similar to developing an RFP. You know, we have a subject matter expert on safe outdoor space, for instance, who helps us write that language. And then the rest of it is a lot of uh, template. You know, here's this document that has, you know, there's the budget template. Here's what has to be filled out on the budget template. Here is a risk questionnaire. And we provide them information on what needs to be provided on the risk questionnaire. So the structure that Bonfire provides is, each of those becomes something they can download and then upload back into the system so that when we go to evaluate them and yes, even score them, we, you know, everything is organized in the same manner. So that's kind of the process that we go through. You know, I, I, I compare it to an RFP, Joel, you may say, well, it's sort of like that, but, and you might be able to explain oh. that better to the audience. No, it's, it, it's just like when you came, you're like, we need something that's, that's, replicable and and something that people can un understand and but you mentioned there are different granting agencies throughout metro and they all have like their unique way of accepting applications a notice of funding availability and somebody has a different grant fee we need something that everybody could say that that could everybody coalesce around 
one system. And when Ken said, I said, let's try it out. Let's let's figure out what we'd have to do to make it work. And so they already had a, uh, a rubric for evaluation of all of these grants. And I'm like, okay, let's now try to figure out how to put that evaluation criteria rubric into the format that Bonfire has. And so, you know, that we could set up individual scoring, that we could do consensus scoring, however you want to you want to do it. And it gave them a whole lot of um, uh, a whole lot of options in how they wanted to, uh, because they weren't really following our rules, they were following their own rules that they, they created. And it, it, it really has provided um, to the public as well, some standard of, oh, you know, I know what to expect. I can, I, I know that this is done in a uh, replicable way and they're following the process that they demonstrated that they said they were going to fo they were going to follow in in the application. I think it's um you know uh, to, to Ken's point I give him a lot of credit for for having been a reviewer of our processes before RFPs in the past and having the the mindset to say hey will this work and then working with our team just to make it happen. We we had to change um you know we created a different department uh, called the American Rescue Plan Team. So we just categorized those those opportunities related to ARPA grants separately. We created uh, a different requirement section when vendors register that you have an op option to select a, a nonprofit now rather than when we didn't have before. So then we have more ability to uh, identify who those uh, grant requesters and 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 uh, submitters are going to be and separate that from the rest of our vendor community, which is, you know, the, the for-profits, MWBEs and the like. So um, we, we, the important thing was thinking through how you're going to set it up for what data you're going to collect and then uh, how you can make sure that that's segmented out from your other um, procurement uh, projects. Right, yeah, because it's, well, it's, you know, if you take away all the labels, um, you know, we're we're getting information from agencies that and to do evaluation of what they want to do with that, but you don't want to muddle the the data up between the silo of the right. American Rescue Plan team and then also what what's going on in, in central procurement. Um, Correct. Okay. Um, and and you know, j just just to even take a step further back, so the RFA process, there's there's grant monies that that come in. Uh, Louisville Metro says, hey, we we want we have this money that we can spend and we need to tie it to these initiatives that can support. Or have something to do with COVID, given that it's the American Rescue Plan funding. These nonprofits are submitting, you know, they're raising their hand through bonfire saying, well, you should consider this project because of this. This is how much it will cost, and this is the impact this would have for the community. Is that generally what, what's happening here? Just to make sure that that I'm on the same page as you guys. Yeah, we'll put out a we'll put out a request in RFA, and we'll say, you know, for instance, we have one called um, uh, Harm Reduction Recovery Housing. So we put out an RFA saying, you know, we know that the increase in substance use uh, during COVID has, has been an issue. Uh, persons with substance use issues oftentimes have trouble keeping housing. So there was this model that the health department has seen in another community and they wanted to look at and they call it harm reduction recovery housing. So they put that out and said, okay, let's see how many people can give us a proposal on this? Uh, has anyone done something like that, or what would their what would it be like if they tried to do that in our community? So we, you know, we get proposals back, we evaluate them, and see which one we think is the best fit for our community. Yeah. Okay. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. And then, um, and then you have to take you take that back before the legislative body to approve those or. Right. Some of them we do, yeah, Joel. Um, yeah. Some of them we'll have to take back to the legislative body, but for some of them, like for instance, um, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, they already said, okay, LAT team, here's $40 million. It, it's going to go to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Let's let them take care of it. Uh, but for the $32 million they gave us for permanent supportive housing, they they just they turned around and said, okay, go out there. We had eight or nine proposals. We're going to select four or five based on the amount of money that we have. But then on the third example would be one where um, they have not told us yet how much money they're going to give us for workforce development. We have all the workforce development proposals. So now we're going to go back to them after we evaluate them in about two weeks. We're going to go back and say we had 
$250 million in workforce development proposals. Um, we think that here are the 10 best proposals or eight best proposals, and that amount is $50, $60 million. And so we'll ask them to approve us for $50, $60 million, and then we'll begin negotiating with the uh, potential proposals, proposers. Yeah, to, to finalize everything up, okay. And then th that's a really good overview of, of, of the, the process from my perspective. Uh, it leads into this, this, this question, which I think has been um, probably the, one of the most daunting things that we hear about for teams in terms of why they haven't looked into you know, diving into these ARP funds or anything like that, but it's, you know, it's, it's the reporting. Um, so let's, you know, so Ken, maybe I'll, I'll kick it off with you. So you move through the process, you review the, the proposals, you understand what projects you want to put forth and, and let's say those are approved. What happens after that? What, what are the reporting requirements and, and how, has, how has the team been able to meet those requirements um, for the project? Yeah, there's three, there's three reports that we're required to provide, uh, two to the U.S. Treasury, one is a quarterly report to the U.S. Treasury Department, which is um, uh, we, lo we have to load it to the U.S. Treasury portal. And then uh, the second one is an annual report. It's the uh, revenue recovery plan, project plan report. So that's annually. It's due every um, July 31st. The quarterly report, of course, is due 30 days after the end of a quarter. The annual, re the, uh, the quarterly report the last time, the first one we did was uh, January 31st, and it was really a bear. It it took two or three people, two weeks working on that to get it completed. A lot of it was, and 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 the next one is due uh, at the end of April. I hope it only takes one week. Is the plan? Let's keep improving so that by the time we get to the second or third, you know, it's down to just a you know a couple days putting it together, pulling the reports from the different systems. I'll have to, I, I like this story. Um, we talked about the analgesic scale. Uh, based on an analgesic scale, was this an aspirin project, an ibuprofen project, hydrocodone, or oxycodone? And so <laughs> our, our grants folks said this first U.S. Treasury report was a hydrocodone level project, you know, at level of effort. So our goal is to get it down to an aspirin level project where, yeah, we have to do some extra work and maybe have to work a little late sometimes to get it done, but it's not going to be as painful as that first one. Um, it was just pulling, a lot of it was pulling together information that was in different systems. And that's, that was the challenge. We think we've developed a good matrix now so that we can start plugging that information in and then directly upload that to the uh, U.S. Treasury portal. The annual yeah. report is going to re require a lot more information. We've already started working on how are we going to do that annual report because we're going to have to provide more uh, key performance indicators. We're going to have to provide more information on outputs and outcomes. Um, that they're expecting, uh, which we don't have to do on a quarterly basis. And then we also have a report that's required monthly to the Metro Council. Um, and that's basically, that one's pretty easy. It's just looking at, here's the basic project information, here's how much it was allocated, here, here's how much is remaining, so that they can just see that there's, what progress is being made. Yeah, okay. Thinking about their reporting requirements is, I'm um, obviously the, the Treasury is providing guidelines on what needs to be included. Are they providing like a template to plug in information or is that really on, on your team to think about what's the vehicle to house this information and communicate it effectively? Um, they didn't provide a template for the for the quarterly report, so we kind of developed our own template for that. They kind of told us what you needed, but then they have a portal that you have to load everything in in. And you, it's kind of difficult to batch upload that information. We weren't able to do that successfully, so we did a lot of cut, you know, copying and pasting into that. For the narrative, for the annual report, they are giving us a template, so we'll be able to use that. And that that'll basically be a PDF document that we just upload, but it'll probably be, you know, a couple hundred pages uh, based on all the reports that we have, all the projects that we have. We're up to about 45 projects right now. Uh, every Every project has to have a unique expense category. So while we may have a project um, and it may have a couple expense categories, so in the U.S. Treasury's mind, we have to break that down into those two or three projects. So it kind of inflates the number of actual projects, but that's the way the U.S. Treasury wants, wants those reported. Yeah, understandable. Okay. 
Uh, and thanks for that, Ken. I, I know, again, just, just from the conversations we've been having, that that's one of the biggest things is they don't understand the reporting or it feels too daunting. Um, so that's that's really good perspective. Um, I think the I have, other- I, oh, I had ahead, somebody Ken. that I hired for, I brought on to work with the Love Accelerator team and his role was gonna be to work with us on our project management discipline. And all he's been working on is reporting. So he hasn't even been able to address that very much. He's doing great work, by the way. Yeah, great, great time for a shout out. We can throw his name in here. He, I'm sure he's yeah. at home watching now or in the office. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the other thing that we've heard a lot about, and, and Joel, I'll push this one over to you. And, and you know, most of our audience is, is a procurement audience, is, as you can imagine. Um, but there's this huge influx of projects coming in. There's this huge influx of funding coming in. But none of that funding can be allocated towards procurement headcount directly. Um, so how have you sort of reconciled this increase of work to where your team can be positioned to manage the, the increase in work? Um, maybe you're adding headcount in other ways, whatever that solution is. Talk, talk to me about how you've approached that challenge. Yeah, thanks, Anthony. Um, well, uh, we, I, you know, there, there, we have been approved for a piece of that, uh, that our funding uh, for administrative costs. And part of the administrative costs is the kind of headcount uh, uh, increase that Ken was mentioning on the grant side and, and his team and, and, and around. If we can just justify it, then, then, then there is a headcount. Right now, um, what, what we're trying to do is just to um, uh, project what our future needs are gonna be, understanding that it's, it is going to be time limited, right? Um, um, the, the work won't won't stop for another uh, several years, but we have to project what is our needs going to look like in, in the future, and how many of those are actually going to come through the procurement office. Because what Ken mentioned was a lot of it is is grants, and that's mm -hmm. not in, in the in the in the procurement space. However, a lot of it is you know departmental spend, um, not a whole lot of construction at this point from, from a, a procurement of goods and services for the city. But, um, but we are having, you know, million dollar spend on a certain projects within departments. And so what our, our struggle has been right now is, you know, the departments end up, I, you know, seeing that they get approved for these projects, but then not really understanding that with that comes these certain requirements. And, there's a lot of need on our side to upskill our own staff and how to manage uh, expectations of departments and also making sure that we're all uh, understanding what the requirements are uh, within 2 CFR 200. And that's not something that we had to do a whole lot of um, heretofore uh, because those departments that uh, uh, leverage grant agreements had staff uh, on the staffing level and the departments that, that handled those, but, but um, there's a big need to upskill our own staff uh, to make sure that we have the most um, uh, that that we can communicate to the department what those expectations are, because we don't want to be procurement doesn't want to be the the reason why we have to uh, 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 not get reimbursed by the federal government for for these funds, and that's often a, a finding that we've seen is like you know because you didn't follow the procurement process according to those requirements. Um, that that's a finding, and we certainly don't want to be the black eye on on the city of Lule for for doing that. So, uh, we when we get to the point of which we think that it is uh, overextending ourselves, uh, right now we're almost on the cusp here. Um, uh, but we will look to either adding sp uh, specific headcount, or we will uh, seek outside uh, contract opportunities to help um, uh, bridge the gap. I guess, to, to release some of the pressure. But again, then it's always for them, bringing them up to speed on Metro procedures and policies and, and such. But I know that there are firms out there that do that, but we're that I kind of see that as a last resort. Mm -hmm. Yeah, understandable. Um, and I mean, I, I think, you know, there, there's no way around it that there is a lot of lift required to be able to leverage these, these funds the right way and, and to do it where you can, you know, check all the boxes and make sure that you do get that reimbursement. Um, I, I, you know, to me though, it seems like, while there's of course an investment that's happening to access the funds, you know, it, it, it is exactly that, right? It's an investment, no matter what that cost is, if we can access $330 million and change 
uh, to invest back into, you know, the municipal government that, and, and, and you know, make the lives of, of the citizens better than, than it's worth it. Um, but of course, that means not much for me. So I'll put it on you guys, yeah. and, and maybe Ken, I'll start off with you. But if there's a, you know, a county or a local government out there thinking, yeah, you know, we, it just feels like a lot of work to access these funds. What, what would you tell to them? Um, either as a inspirational bout or just uh, what the reality is and, you know, why they should be doing this if they're not doing it already. <laughs> well, I mean, I think if your community is, I, there are some communities that are refusing the dollars. And I think because of the complexity or maybe there's political reasons they're refusing them, you know, our community looked at it and said, you know, we looked at it as an opportunity to, you know, uh, to look at improving what we're doing, uh, improving our our resilience, improving our um, our our ability to rebound from the pandemic. So I think it's I think it's worth it for the community. Uh, we're certainly learning a lot as we're going through it. We're you know using some muscles maybe we haven't had to use in a while or that we've used. Now we're using them a lot more. Um, I, I think for Louisville, it's something. It's an opportunity that we could not pass up. Uh, for our city. We also had some guiding documents that we had already put together, you know, building back better together. So that's similar to the federal legislation. So we're, you know, we're using those documents as our guiding documents to continue uh, to look at improving uh, what we're doing. And I look at the our team, what we're doing, the Louisville Accelerator team, as a continuous improvement project. It's, you know, it's an iterative thing. We're not going to get everything right in the first couple months or the first year, but Hopefully by year two, if something like this comes along again, we'll be we'll be able to handle it. Yeah, thanks, Ken. Uh, Joel, anything that you yeah. would want to say to anyone in those shoes? Yeah, I would just say that this, regardless of 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 the lift, it's a necessary catalyst for recovery. It really is. You know, um, just the presence of now we might not see these projects. Um, have immediate results, but these are long, these are investments that we're going to see the benefits from hopefully years, years and years, uh, 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 years from now. And so to be a part of that, uh, that change for your community um, is, is something that, that you just have to believe in. If you don't believe in, 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 in government is a, a, a function of good and to serve, serve the public, uh, you have to have, you know, true believers to say that this is this money is being put to good use, and and then just commit to doing that. And I think, um, you know, you either see it as a oh another burden on the back office of government, or you say this is trans this could transform our city or our town, and we have the opportunity to do that. And you just need leadership um, from every level. We have a unique opportunity where we have. Not only leadership within our mayor's office, but also the legislative body combined, saying this is, uh, we're, we all believe that this is transform, this could be transformational, and um, uh, there has to be the political will, and then the people who get the job done. And uh, from my experience, uh, uh, I, I'll put procurement people up against anybody, and they they do the they do the job. They help do the job. They do. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I've saved a, a rousing one minute left for questions from the audience. I was expecting to see more questions in chat, but I think everyone was just listening really closely. Um, if you have questions, now's a good time to throw them in. Um, if not, we can we can wrap it up. But um, while well, someone's putting a question in there, let me. I think Joe, what you said is really important about transformational. Um, cause as we were putting our team together, we said, you know, we can do transactional stuff all the time. That's day to day work, daily work. Let's look at what we can do that's transformational. And I think that's what we're hoping that many of our projects are going to be transformational so that we can look back five, 10, 15 years from now and say that really did make a difference. Thanks for reminding me of that. Well, we're just rolling up on two o'clock now, guys, um, and I, I don't see any questions coming through. But I think, you know, the overview of the, what how you handle this and and how you think about this was extremely comprehensive, uh, at least from my opinion, anyway. And I mean, I, I think, you know, to, to end off on the note, just you know, what is the role of government and what is the duty of government for its citizens, and you know, really taking up that mantle, I think, uh, is probably about as good of a note as we can end on as any. Um, 
thanks so much, Joel, and thanks so much, Ken, for taking some time to, to talk to this topic with everyone, um, to share your expertise. I'm, I'm sure you'll probably be getting a few pings about, hey, how did you, you know, hey, Ken, can you send over me that, that template for your quarterly report or whatever it is? I, sure. At least I hope so. Um, but yeah, thanks so much, guys. I, I, I know, you know, you didn't have to do this, and, and I genuinely appreciate the time and, and the, uh, the feedback that you gave. Thank you Thanks. very much, Anthony. Appreciate it, and you're you're a great stand-in for Omar. Yeah, thanks. I'll, I'll, I appreciate that, Joel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but with that being said, um, there's probably some other stuff I should be doing here. We we have a ton of eBooks at Bonfire. Uh, Go Bonfire.com is the website. We have eBooks on helping teams draft RFPs. We have content on how teams run RFPs. Uh, we're, we're we're trying to lift up the community. There's a slide here that says all that, but I, I'm just going to wrap it up here because we are over time but i appreciate all of you for tuning in and yeah make you know feel free to go on our website and just type in a question there if you have any other questions and if you have any questions for for joel or ken uh reach find their contact information if you want or just connect with us and we can sort of circulate those through but uh, thanks everyone for the time and, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon thanks everyone thanks bye bye, -bye. take care